Um, I'm going to, yeah, I think everybody's in here, so I'm going to get started. Um, we're going to be using the chat function. So um, you're all muted, uh, something that I've wanted to do for years in various places. But uh, <laughs> so, so you are you are all muted, but we are using the chat. So if you uh, are familiar with the chat, uh, that's what we're um, what we're using today for any questions or problems. So, you know, I'm hoping that everybody can see us and hear us. And if not, if you could send me, um, you know, send, send a message to us because Anne and I will be very lonely without you. We'll be clipping along through the program <laughs> and not know. And that would be, um, that would be really not so funny. So, um, so with that, I'm going to get started. I'm not seeing any issues in the chat. I'm not seeing anything uh, that you're saying to me. So um, we'll get started. So, um, Several people are not muted. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you for telling me that. So um, the reason that we mute people is just to make sure that, um, you know, the background noise and such is something that we can keep to a minimum and then you'll be able to hear us better. Um, you know, the mute function also works so that if there's any um, things happening in your house that, you know, we're not, <laughs> we're, you're not sharing that with us. Um, <laughs> This is a Duke Farms program, as you probably uh, know. Uh, I'm not at Duke Farms, and as an example, I'm here in Bordentown City in uh, central New Jersey, as some people think of South uh, Jersey, and there's a street construction project going along. So, you know, they're ripping up the street, there's a lot of background noise, and I'm hoping that that um, is not coming across. Um, so, as I said, I'm Kate Riley. I'm from Duke Farms. I'm the manager of education, which is the absolute best job in the entire universe. Um, we are um, a thousand acres or and more of public access property located in Hillsboro, New Jersey. For those people who are not familiar with Duke Farms or need a little refresher, um, under general conditions, it's a place where folks can hike and bike and um, kind of enjoy you know, the 18 miles of uh, trails. And um, some people come up to see our sustainability practices. We are um, certainly a model of all of that. And we typically throughout the year have about 300 classes or so for toddlers all the way up to people who look like me and beyond. Um, and that is all to advanced our mission for visitors to become informed stewards of the land. And that is our Duke Farms mission. Of course, under our, our current circumstances, we've pivoted. We're using, uh, heavily using a digital uh, format and we have um, 50 plus resources that are, um, they're all posted on our digital hub. Uh, it's a portal that houses all of our resources and we hope that you've explored those. Uh, they are intended not just for formal educators, although there are content standards listed and so forth, but they are for families, for informal educators, for people who are just curious and want to learn more about nature. Uh, there are activities and lesson plans and videos and all sorts of different ways that you can engage in the nature of your own yard or maybe a, you know, a local green space. Um, another way that we're, of course, engaging with our public is through Zooms, such as this one. And uh, the one that uh, you'll be hearing today is presented by a guest of ours, Anne Cucciera, who is a wonderful uh, docent uh, volunteer at Duke Farms. Um, she is a retired formal educator, and uh, she's doing this uh, PowerPoint as a result of a project that she was participating in also. And it is one of our partnerships with Rutgers University called Environmental Stewards. Uh, it's a year long class. And one of the um, elements to become certified is to do a project in your local area in, in the area where you live. We're really, really happy that Anne uh, selected uh, to participate in a project that brought so much joy and learning to Duke Farms, and uh, she'll be talking about that today. Um, on another housekeeping note, 
Um, could you also make sure that you type your questions in the chat? I will be sending questions and answers to you. I have all of your emails. So if there's any questions that come up, um, please make sure that you send those questions uh, to me during this chat or also at Kay Riley at Duke Farms and I will get back to you. Um, other ideas, suggestions, just things that often, you know, after the program that you think about, you can send them along to, uh, to me and Ann and I will work on them and, and um, send them back to you. So um, with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Ann Cucciera. So thank you, oh. Kay. Um, yeah. It's really a pleasure to be here with everybody today. I'm so happy to do this. This is a project um, that I was passionate about from the beginning. And now that Duke Farms is closed temporarily, um, I thought I would share this whole idea with you. And I thought, wow, you could do something similar in your own homes. It doesn't matter if you live in an apartment or have a small space, you can still do this kind of project. I got started um, with thinking about doing a project that tied education in with nature. And one of the great books that I have read, and I really would um, recommend if you have time to read it, is Last Child in the Woods by Richard Lauv. Um, a quote of his that just really struck me after teaching for 37 years, um, I'll read it too. It says, an environment-based education movement at all levels of education will help students realize that school isn't supposed to be a polite form of incarceration, but a portal to the wider world. And I thought, wow, I would love to open that portal for people in the wider world people that maybe are disabled, people that are elderly and can't get around or of all walks of life or people that simply don't have a lot, a lot of time to go out into nature and, and enjoy it. Now, um, there were some things that were important to me as I did this project with Duke Farms. Um, I had a passion for educating future generations. Um, overall, we recognize the need to replace sprawling suburban lawns with native plants that attract pollinators and provide healthier habitats. And I'll get more into the um, pollinator-friendly um, plants as, as the um, presentation goes on. Um, the other thing is to make plant life more accessible to people with mobility issues and sensory issues and, and learning disabilities. So it's easier always to break things down into to smaller bits, I, I find, when you're starting out a project. For example, I'll take myself for example, um, gardening. The whole idea of putting a garden in my backyard was just overwhelming. But this is easy. This is something that you can do in small bits and, and it doesn't require, it's not a whole lot of money to get it started. Um, another thing is you can condense a variety of plants to a small, more manageable area. And the other thing is that um, I wanted to provide Duke Farms with an opportunity for pop-up education. Pop-up education being, um, you know, just a, a random moment in time where you have a lot of people interested and you can teach them a new concept about nature and, and about becoming an environmental steward. Okay, you get to see me over here with my sensory, um, my mobile sensory garden. You can see that cart right there. That um, I, with Kate's help, she hunted that cart down. She did actually bought me two so I could um, overlap certain displays. And um, it has wheels and you'll see um, things hanging from it, information cards, and this happens to be my herbal uh, display. And this is the first one I started because I thought it would be a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, you know, people wanna see some of the herbal plants that maybe go into the food. Um, there are a lot of different varieties of smells, tastes, and textures to the plants. So this was one of the displays, and I'll get into more detail about that later. Why a mobile garden? Why does it, why move, be able to move it around? 
Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be, but what's really nice about it, and um, I, this was something that, that came about, I had originally wanted to put a sensory garden in, in the community garden. Um, but I, it, Kate talked me out of that and she, she said, well, why not do a mobile garden? It would reach more people. And she was absolutely correct in that. The cart can be moved around from the inside to the outside. So on nice days, like today, you could move it outside um, and the plants can get more sun or, or just more air. Um, and also in your home, you can move it from window to window, depending on the time of year. Um, it's very easy to, to do that. Uh, mobile gardens, as I said before, are good for rural, suburban, and urban settings. So even if you live in a city, this is something that would be quite easy to do. Um, it allows for seasonal flexibility um, um, from time to time and around your home. And um, while working in the garden, because you'll be planting and doing certain things, you can move it to a section of the house that is close to water. All right, and the way I got started with this project is I discussed the ideas with environmentalists and educators. Um, I researched plants native to the area. And it, the most important is I found a sponsor and they've been, uh, Duke Farms has been extraordinarily uh, supportive of this project and continue, they continue to be supportive. Okay, after I got the idea, I started looking around. I like to be outside. I explored a lot of places like Bowman's Hill Plant Nursery, uh, the Sensory Garden at Colonial Park in Somerset County, New Jersey, uh, Nature Preserves, and Duke Farms. I do a lot of walking now that I'm, that I'm retired, and that's what I did. I walked around to get some ideas on plants and actual sensory um, garden displays. It's important to know what grows well in your area because you want something that's native to your area. Um, you want some variety. And then I look for different display ideas as well. Okay, and this is one example of one of the gardens. This is a rose garden at the far end of the rose garden. There is a sensory garden and it's equipped with braille labels. Okay, what do you need to get started to start your own sensory garden in your own home? Um, be sure you have a window or area that has a southern exposure. It could be like a, a sun porch. It could be just, just like I said, a window. Um, you should have a cart or a bin that allows for drainage, doesn't ruin your floor. <laughs> um, a spray bottle, 20 to $40 to spend on plants and soil for each season. And I would say five to 10 minutes a day once you get it up and running for plant maintenance. And then optional, a notebook or loose, loose leaf binder in which to keep your plant research and notes. And I'll get more into that later. Okay, once you've decided what you want, want to do, you can shop around. This is a fabulous time of year to shop around for plants. Um, I just listed some that I had gone to. I went to quite a few to look around. Um, I like to try to stay with organic plants if possible, but it's not necessary. And then also Duke Farms actually has a native uh, plant nursery. So I looked there as well. So they actually take plants from the property and propagate them and then in this little nursery and then plant them in different areas. Okay, so what I did, and I continue to do, I do four different displays a year. I try to tie something in with each season. You know, and it gets a little hard when it gets around um, uh, winter time, Christmas time. But there are some things you can do for that too. Like I said before, and that was the picture you saw of me, that I had um, started with herbals and I had all of those in my display that are listed there. And I'll show you pictures of each one of those. We have basil, chervil, chives, cilantro, coriander, 
I don't know if you can see it in the right hand side over there, dill. The chives, um, if you take a look at that, those, those flowers are great for attracting pollinators. And they're, they're easy to grow in your yard if you wanted to, to do that eventually. Um, it's a, just a great plant. Others are marjoram, mint, oregano, rosemary, sage, and thyme. And I just want to stop for a minute and talk about mint. In this part of the Northeast, mint is considered an invasive. That means it can pretty much take over an area. If you were to plant it outside in a garden, I would re recommend keeping it in a container of some sort because it would spread very rapidly and it becomes more like a weed. But um, it does have a wonderful smell. There's different kinds of mints out there. I had actually found one that was a chocolate mint. It did smell like chocolate and taste like chocolate, believe it or not. Um, it, was, it was an interesting um, herbal. Okay, in the late spring through summer, um, I, I had pollinator uh, friendly plants. And here are some that are listed. These are all native to the Northeast in our area. But depending on where you live, you may find others that are um, native to your particular area. And this is where you would have to do some research. So you'd have things like Blazing Stars, Black Eyed Susan, Bone Set, Cardinal Flower, Cone Flower, Cup Flower. Hyssop, Milkweed, Mountain Mint, which is not invasive, Aster, Obedient Plant, and goldenrod. And you could probably find some of these in, in areas around you, um, maybe not, not even in a nursery, but out in a field. Of course, always ask permission before you take any plants. Um, but you could try one or two of each of these in your own mobile sensory garden. And you can see um, with the milkweed, wonderful plant for attracting um, butterflies, especially the monarch butterflies. And this is actually um, the pollinator friendly plants. This is kind of the core of my project because we want to try to um, plant things that do attract bees and birds and butterflies and things, and they can help pollinate other plants. These are good to plant around a garden where you have a vegetable garden because it'll encourage these pollinators to come and pollinate your tomato plants, your um, pea plants, whatever. And so very good for the environment. Um, late fall, early winter, uh, that's kind of where I ran into problems with, with the sensory garden, but um, there are some wonderful, wonderful, um, beautiful ornamental um, plants that you could possibly use or do in the wintertime. If you go to nurseries, hot, you know, have um, hot houses, you could probably find some of these. Cyclamen, beautiful, beautiful plants. One thing I have to tell you about these though, you do not water them from the top down. You have to put them in some kind of bowl and put water into the bowl. Uh, you have put the pot into the bowl, otherwise you'll kill the plant. Learn that the hard way. You have ornamental peppers. These are really cool. They remind me of um, Christmas lights on a Christmas tree. Pansies, these are pretty hardy and you can find them in the late fall. 
and there's always winter cabbage. And let me caution you on winter cabbage. Like any kind of cabbage, if it's near heat or if it's in too much sun, it will begin to smell. So if you get a cabbage plant, you might want to get something that's really small and make sure you get it outside from time to time. But it works well. There's some really nice um, ornamental cabbages. The other thing I did once uh, winter set in, um, I took a class at Duke Farms on growing microgreens. And microgreens are really interesting plants. I love them. I still grow them. And um, you can eat what you, you produce, which is nice. I throw them in salads. I throw microgreens in egg, eggs, um, soups. And they're very easy and very rewarding to grow. Why? Because you have a full-grown microgreen display in less than 10 days. Um, you, you, all you need is a container. You need some kind of seed starting soil. Um, optional, I don't have a grow light, never had to use a grow light, but if you wanted to, you could have a grow light. I ordered my seeds. If you look in the lower left hand corner, um, I had the basic salad mix, which I had the best success with. You can order that online. Um, that I would recommend that. Um, I forget the, the, what I had the, um, what company I used for that. If you give me a second, I will. True Leaf Market. You can order that online. It's relatively inexpensive. You need a spray bottle and you need paper towels. And here's what you do. You choose a container, two to four inches deep. I've used the, um, the loaf pans. I've also used um, Tupperware that I don't, can't find the lids for. And just make sure you put holes in the bottom. Build a tray of two to four inches of pre-moistened seed starting mix. You can spread seeds over the top of the soil and press it in. Moisten the seeds and then cover with a damp paper towel for about two days. Just keep it covered, two days. The third day, take the, the damp paper towel off and place the tray in a warm, dark location until, well, you take it off after the seeds begin to germinate. And you, number seven, after germination, you remove the paper towel to expose it to sunlight. Sprouts should mature in about five to seven days. You can harvest with a sharp knife or scissors. Do not reuse the soil for future plantings and enjoy the sprouts with your favorite recipes. So this is a really fun, rewarding thing to do, especially with kids. And there you have it. There is my microgreen display. With sprouts, I have pea sprouts, I have the, the general salad mix, I have um, carrot tops, and you just cut them and enjoy them. Now, earlier on, you saw me with my first display, and there were little cards dangling down from each of the plants, or underneath each of the plants. I researched every single plant that I used for the mobile sensory garden. I made a card up for each one and tried to get all my information on, on one card. I had such things as the common name of the plant, the scientific name. Um, I had a couple of photos. I have here, be sure to credit the photographer, but you're not, you're doing this in your own home. So you can, you can just Google pictures and use that. It's part of making the cards. And this, again, would be a great project, I think, for an older child, maybe fifth grade on up, to do this kind of research. You would have the height of the plant. Is it a perennial or an annual? The uses of the plant. And native to what area? Hopefully it's native to your area, but if it's not, tell where it's from. 
a brief description, the planting requirements, and then I always include web websites and sources, so you may want to get more information as time goes on. And here is a sample research card. And I try to keep all the information on one card, as I said before. You're probably not going to use, a, use them to display the information to the public in your home. You can use, a, I would suggest, a, a three ring binder or a journal you can keep this in. Um, and as time goes on too, you might wanna keep notes on what plants work well and what plants do poorly. You can even put a sticky note on there and say, eh, don't do this one again, this didn't, did not do well. And then for daily um, maintenance, you should just check on your plants daily. You can't help but not because you're, they're right there in your home. Um, replace and compost plants that are past their prime. Check the soil mo moisture. Of course, if, if they need more water, water them. Check for fungus, mold, or yellowed leaves. And this is optional. Change the display to coincide with the seasons. Um, and like I said, I had two cards so I could overlap plant displays. As one was fading, the other one came in. Um, and then keep records. And then some ideas for sharing your plant display um, in your home. Of course, you can't do this now, but perhaps soon in the future. Have a garden party in your home. Offer to share your display with a scouting or 4-H group. Um, students can present the display in a school science fair. Um, you can take pictures along, you know, as, as your plants grow and keep a digital scrapbook. Have an herbal sampling tapas party. Or um, try an edible plant and a recipe and share with your family. Okay, so the bigger picture, you, you have gotten a snapshot of how maybe you could set up your sensory garden at home. But the big picture is um, what impact, what environmental impact did this project have? And I would say on any given beautiful weekend, um, as many as 500 to 2,000 visitors pass through the doors of Duke Farms. And many interested visitors flock to the Century Garden and inquire about the plants. Um, one, one day, it was Memorial Day weekend last year, and I was out monitoring, I had brought the Century Garden outside at the end of a, um, a walkway where a lot of visitors seemed to pass. And in one weekend, I had over 300 um, people stop by and ask questions about it. Um, so what visitors find out and what you will find out hopefully as you do this at home, um, what plants can they use to convert lawn space to pollinator friendly plant space? Instead of having a green lawn, have a section or sections of your lawn or of your yard with pollinator friendly plants. Um, you'll find out too what plants can grow in homes over the winter. I mean, sometimes the winter comes and then we don't have plants and, you know, the things to, to give us pleasure and get us close to nature. So you can find out what, what grows well over the winter. Um, what edible plants can be, can be easily produced at home? The herbals, the microgreens, I mean, these, these things you can use in your cooking. Um, I've also discovered in doing this project that more people are interested in growing their own crops and reducing packaging waste and eliminating transportation costs of food. And this all goes into the um, Duke Farms vision of uh, being an environmental steward and, and being more conscious of preserving our environment and um, you know, taking care of the earth. People are interested in using um, less chemicals, insecticides, herbicides, and pesticides. So it, it's also it was a good opening to have the sensory garden there to even talk about these things. As people will ask me, well, what do you use a, a insecticide on these plants? No. I do not. We don't, in, in our own home, we don't use insecticides, herbicides, or pesticides. 
you don't use anything and 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 it's fine i mean you know you have to work around it and i think um we're finding in our own home and in in our neighborhood too um we're seeing more and more wildlife uh, the variety of birds and insects and wonderful you know it's just wonderful and i think it's because we're using less of these or none of these kinds of chemicals um, again as i said before you're learning useful information about potential food sources and then um, there's increased awareness of native plant species as opposed to invasive and i, I talked about the mint um, yes it's great to have in your herbal sensory garden but just be careful that it is can be invasive okay and again benefits of a sensory garden raises plant awareness um, particularly with the relationship between certain plants and bees butterflies and birds it gives an opportunity to educate households about the wisdom of lawns pesticides and sex insecticides and fertilizers fresh herbal plants beat spices in a bottle any day if you don't believe me try it <laughs> um, it's relatively easy to maintain young children become more comfortable with plants and they get to know them up close so you can introduce them to one plant at a time and if they feel successful for example the microgreens could be a good start um, they, then they're encouraged to grow more um, garden is um contained in an area that is relatively easy to maintain not overwhelming like a huge garden in your backyard and the elderly and physically impaired can experience plant life up close and the future of the sensory pro garden project um, it is ongoing at duke farms once we open again uh, we will have another display and we'll change it indefinitely throughout the seasons. We may experiment with different plants from season to season, but um, for the most part, we'll stick with that kind of schedule of the herbals, pollinator friendly plants, the ornamentals, and the microgreens. Um, possibly, it may be um, a vis vis um, visible at a farmer's market. Um, travel to other environmental centers and propose similar projects. Uh, continue implementation of pollinator friendly gardens, especially in the community gardens and lawns in the immediate area. Um, we'll explore different plants and then outreach to schools, 4 H, and scouting. Okay, and then here's some resources. If you live in the Hillsborough, Somerset County area, um, the first two may be very accessible for you. Bellamy Co-op, Bowman's Hill Wildlife Preserve, and then of course Duke Farms, anybody can go to that dukefarms.org, uh, look up distance learning. And there's a, a ton of video resources. And then I like to use the last, it's called Pollinator Friendly Plants for the Northeast United States but depending on where you live you could find pollinator friendly plants for the southeast to united states um, northwest i mean you can look that up it's a, a great resource um, to look it, it they have each pollinator friendly plant on a separate page you can access it you don't have to download it on your and print it you can just get it on your computer and it's a wonderful resource to get more information and then if you want more information about the sensory garden and duke farms please contact kate riley who introduced me earlier and her email is right there and then i wanted to give a special um thanks to the Rutgers stewards program for inspiring me to do and supporting me for doing this project and that's all i have well, thank you very much, Anne. I, I've collected some of the uh, questions, and I know that we only have like a minute or two, but would you please tell us again about the seed mix and where you purchased it for the microgreens? I know that you had that package. Would you yes. um, show that it's, to everyone? 
It's called, um, can you see me? Yes. I'm going to say it slowly. It's called the um, Basic Salad Mix. It's from the True Leaf Market. True Leaf Market. And they have other mixtures there too. Um, you can go on Amazon. Or you could just Google True Leaf Market and order from there. They have like a pea mix, a carrot mix. There's a bunch of different ones. I just found the basic salad mix to be the most successful and the best tasting. But try out, you know, try other ones as well. Okay, so there were questions also because you gave so many valuable resources. Um, I just want to reiterate that uh, in the group, we are sending you the presentation. We, all of the resources will be sent to you. Um, and also, you know, as you have any other questions that come up, uh, my email once again is kryley at Duke Farms. I put it in the chat, but you can easily find me in the directory. And you know, there are things that are going to come up. We answer questions all the time. Don't be timid. Um, you know, Anne and I will get right back to you. And I think that there are, are so many different ways to incorporate this. You know, you can start it, you can Zoom your family right now and kind of tell them what's going on. I mean, I see this as a wonderful, you know, as a, as a former, um, you know, formal educator, I would have loved to have had this in the foyer of my school. I mean, it's just great if you work in a business or an office, wouldn't it be fabulous to be able to smell things and be able to have that, uh, that personal feeling. And I can tell you that Anne's project was so popular in our visitor center. I mean, I hate to say, but the plants were like, they were a little mauled, you know, people were like <laughs> smelling them and touching them and rubbing them. And that's what we wanted. That's what we wanted to happen. Because yes. when you make that personal connection with nature, it has lasting impact. And that's what we want to do at Duke Farms. So you know, we had to freshen them up a couple of times because they really, they really did take a, take a hit. People were trying to be responsible, but, you know, I mean, it's all about all of those senses coming into play and, you know, what that is about memory and, and what we learn about plants. So I just want to thank Anne again. Um, and I want to reassure you that we're sending things out to you and these resources. And you know what, if you start one, could you send us a picture? I, we, I would love to start a gallery with your photographs, you know, small little things that you've tried at home to, you know, something more elaborate. It's all good, you know, it is all good. So even starting with one or two plants is a, is a way to go. So I just want to um, thank Anne again. I think it was really fun working with Anne and I am thrilled to be able to continue to work with Anne and uh, other docents and volunteers at Duke Farms and of course partner with Rutgers University. So with that, I think I'm going to be signing off the whole presentation will be sent to you. And um, once again, you know, a round of applause. And uh, okay. thank you very much for joining us. Yes, thank you. Okay. I appreciate it. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Have a great day. Thank you.